And as part of bridge work, we wanted to bring some of those students out of their different departments to talk to you and also to talk to one another. Um, environmental change and challenge is not just one department's province. It is relevant to the research and teaching and learning that we do across all of the divisions and departments, academic and otherwise, at this institution and at every institution. And we're delighted to have a real mix of disciplines here today. We have geology, we have engineering, Dr. Hanrahan said, we need engineers involved in this. We have theology and ministry. We have meteorology and environmental science and chemistry. So how about that? And we have six really wonderful students to talk to you today. They're going to introduce full circle and bring it back to the uh, sustainable renewable energy side of things. Uh, my name is Aaron Mader. I'm a senior here, meteorology major. Uh, I'm, I'm originally from Cape Girardeau, Missouri, which if you have no idea where that is, it's like 100 miles south of St. Louis, right on the Mississippi River. Um, I'm going to be talking about wind energy science, and particularly a study that I did last summer at Iowa State University, um, looking at uh, the, uh, the role that wind energy and wind turbines play in affecting downstream atmospheric turbulence. So the main motivation for this study, Iowa State has this really cool idea of uh, looking at the way that wind farms and wind turbines impact surrounding areas and local climates, which a lot of this is may go, I'm going to try and keep it like surface level, not make it go too far over your head. It's a little literally complicated, some of the stuff I don't even understand, but it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool stuff. So um, general idea, uh, wind turbines, they create pressure perturbations in the atmosphere, they influence turbulence. You can picture spinning blades in the atmosphere. Um, and the way that wind energy is created is, is you're extracting kinetic energy from the wind and converting it into power. Well, what happens to that energy deficit? So downstream of wind turbines, you have this deficit in kinetic energy that disperses in a number of different ways. You've got atmospheric turbulence and things like that. That's the primary, uh, the primary way that that energy is dispersed. Um, on a small scale, in terms of your pressure fluctuations, you can influence uh, surface processes, different kinds of uh, exchanges uh, between the surface and the air. Um, large scale, you can create actual like wave motion and turbulence and stuff like that, which I'll get into in just a minute. Um, so if we understand this behavior, we can better understand um, how wind turbines are going to affect not only their own environments, but uh, each other and efficiency of uh, the surrounding wind farms and things like that. So just a little bit about the background of what's going on here. So the boundary layer is essentially the lowest layer of the atmosphere. It's the part of the atmosphere that is influenced by the surface. Um, usually it's about a kilometer from the ground up, if you can picture that. So if you imagine like walking out on like a black top surface or a parking lot, um, it's, it's hotter there in the summer, right? You've got heating going on in the parking lot. It's heating the air above you more so than if you were standing in like the middle of a grassy field or something like that. So anything that is going to be influenced by the surface in the air is what we would call the atmospheric boundary layer. Um, I put those little curly Q looking things in there because that's supposed to represent turbulence. There's a lot of turbulence, there's a lot of mixing that goes on in the boundary layer um, that impacts surface exchanges of things like momentum, so wind speed as you move and how that changes as you move up in the vertical. Um, heat, like I was mentioning, the parking lot is a great way to visualize that, as well as water vapor. So if you ever spend your summer in Iowa like I did last summer and you're standing in the middle of a cornfield in July, it's really humid and really gross outside. Um, so the way this applies to wind energy um, is this idea of turbine wakes. So this is a really, really good uh, visualization that's used in a lot of different papers and a lot of different uh, research topics that all revolve around wind power. Um, it's the idea that there's this cone-shaped deficit of energy in turbulence that kind of is uh, projected downstream as uh, wind turbines extract energy from the wind. So what we looked at uh, is this massive equation, which is jumbled up, um, but essentially the term that we care about is this pressure uh, perturbation term. It's a big, long math and stuff like that that goes with the boundary layer. It's kind of a mess. So we looked at um, the pressure correlation term, so just the part of that, that massive, long equation that deals with how pressure changes uh, and how it fluctuates as wind turbines spin. So the way we did this is we built um, these little tower configurations in a, uh, a natural boundary layer, so just in the middle of a cornfield, and then also in a wind turbine or a wind farm in the middle of Iowa. Those are the two sites. The one in the northwest corner there is our site that was outside of the boundary or outside of the wind farm, and 
and then this site that was kind of over here, uh, those little dots represent all of the different wind turbines in this wind farm, and that was the second site. Um, this is what one of our little tower configurations looked like. Um, the weird looking claw thing is called a sonic anemometer that measures uh, humidity, temperature, wind in the like X, Y, and Z, or U, V, and W directions. Um, and then the little dual disc looking thing that's up there towards the top is called a nanobarometer um, that measures uh, pressure fluctuations at a very, very small scale that allows us to see how that pressure is going to change. So uh, what we ended up finding, uh, this is all preliminary work. Um, these graphics here are just ways of visualizing how much pressure uh, perturbations and how much turbulence is actually created from uh, wind turbines. And what we notice is the top two graphs are the daytime and nighttime graphs and our site is not located in a wind farm. Um, and we're looking in kind of this range here, and you'll see the circles pop up here where uh, the primary areas that we were looking um, to see if we had some kind of a, uh, an indication that wind turbines were in fact having a big implication, like an influence on turbulence. And uh, what we saw is that in the daytime and the nighttime at our non-boundary layer, or our non-wind farm boundary layer site, there wasn't a whole lot else going on that you wouldn't expect. You know, there's, there's general turbulence throughout the day that's created by a variety of different sources. But we started seeing these indications that uh, wind farms, in fact, were having influences on turbulence uh, to some degree uh, by these weird swaths so that you can see the brighter colors in those areas where I've got circled. Um, and I won't go into too many technical details about these figures because it's probably boring and it's <laughs> So just generally what we were able to find from this research is uh, what does it mean for uh, wind resources and wind uh, infrastructure expansion and things like that? Um, what it means is that when we first discovered how to use wind power, um, it was really cool. Like we, we had another way of uh, fostering renewable energy and finding a sustainable energy source. But when we first started building wind turbines, it wasn't responsibly. We, we had them, so we just wanted to build them because we could extract wind and make more energy. But there's a, there are many different ways that we can do this. It's a lot more efficient than the way we started to do it now. In other words, we can start to research and understand more about how to place wind turbines in more responsible areas how to utilize them in the best way, the most efficient way possible. Um, also, we need to understand where we're putting them and how this extraction of energy um, can affect local climates. If you, you know, for instance, if, you, if you're extracting a large amount of energy and it, uh, it affects your, your moisture transport at the surface, you can actually create a local, like a desert climate, so to speak, to where you may uh, influence what kind of crops are going to grow there and things like that. Um, and then in this particular topic, ongoing research, uh, regarding public opinion about wind farms, a lot of people don't think they're very aesthetic. I personally think they're really cool, but some people don't like large spinning fans uh, in their environments. Uh, so figuring out how the public will respond to these kinds of things, as well as uh, how uh, the turbulence and uh, energy extraction can influence other uh, uh, variables in the atmosphere and things like that, how that may vary further in the vertical, uh, as well as uh, gathering data for longer periods of time to better understand the topic and things like that. 